I'm Paul Higgins, an ex-corporate executive turned business owner who for five years struggled to grow a cloud consulting business whilst battling a chronic disease. With the help of mentors and experts, I got the business model right, built a sales and marketing engine and developed a high performing team that ended in a successful exit. I received a kidney transplant from a mate and now on my second life, I dedicate my time to helping other cloud consultants scale quickly with less effort to enjoy life. Detecting an accent, I'm an Aussie working globally from Melbourne, Australia. I interview successful cloud consultants sharing their scaling stories to give you inspiration and practical tips. I have dedicated experts four cloud consultants on the show to save you time and money by working with the right people. If you want to scale quickly with less effort to enjoy life, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Paul Higgins and welcome to the Cloud Consultant Show, episode number 465. Today's topic is the inner workings of a 50-person HubSpot agency and you're going to learn lots of things, but in particular, you're going to learn how to use inbound to grow your agency. The second is the value of reviews on your partner platform and some really cool scripts that you can take and apply. And the third is using point systems for retainers. If you're a first time, welcome. It's great to have you here. And if you'd like it, please subscribe. If you're a cloud consultant, someone that consults and deploys on a SaaS platform, and as you can tell by Dan, our guest today, uh, agencies as well, uh, you're in the right place. And if you're a regular, thanks for your support. And please email. Let me know that you're listening at paul at paulhigginsmentoring.com. And also let me know what topics you'd love to cover. And maybe you as a listener might want to come on as a guest as well. There's a summary and the links in the show notes. You can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. And before we interview Dan, I'd like to thank our sponsors. The first is the Cloud Consultants Collective, the world's only revenue-focused collective for cloud consultants. It's peers answering questions quicker than you can get off Google or YouTube. Don't believe me? Try it for yourself. Just go to cloudconsultantscollective.com to join for free today. And the other is SendSpark. It's a fantastic video platform where you can send personalized videos at scale. You can get a free six months at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash SendSpark. Today's guest is Dan. He's a trainer, storyteller, podcaster, speaker, writer, and blended family dad. Dan lives to put more love in the world and create a better space for everyone. And he certainly shares that today. And for his day job, he's a HubSpot advisor at Impulse Creative, and he teaches coaches and advises HubSpot users. And as I said, he gives a really good perspective on working in a HubSpot agency. So now what I'll do is hand you over to Dan Moyne from impulsecreative.com. Great to have you here, Dan. Oh, it's so good to be here. I appreciate you making time for me today. Yeah, no, well, thanks for making time because I know it's President's Day in the US. We're uh, recording in February of 2023, if you're listening to the back catalogue. But uh, yeah, thanks for making yourself available. I'm very excited to have you on. We've had some HubSpot agency and and partners on, but uh, it's always good to have another one, another one with a different perspective. And uh, you're the employee, not the owner. So that's a really good perspective to give as well. But why don't we kick off with impulsecreative.com. Who do they love to work with? Who's your ideal clients? Our ideal clients really are businesses who want to grow. There's a shocker, right? Uh, Who want to grow with the inbound methodology, who maybe have seen other forms of marketing and sales and revenue operations not work all that great. And we're looking for something a little bit different. We work with exclusively HubSpot customers. Sometimes that means HubSpot says, hey, Impulse is great. You should work with them. Other times it's us saying, hey, we're good at what we do and we like HubSpot. And people go, oh, okay, cool. Um, So that's kind of the generalized part of it. Uh, We work with companies, I'd call it the SMB market, which again, sounds really generic. But um, we're not necessarily always the best at the enterprise level, but we have some pretty good sized clients. But we also... We're not able to really help effectively the micro entrepreneurs necessarily. Um, I think about like in my little area here in Southwest Michigan, the small businesses that say, oh, I need help getting more clients in the door. Great. Let me give you some resources. You probably can't afford impulse creative. So we're in that small to medium to almost large size business, but probably not quite enterprise, I would say. 
Yeah, great. And and I know it's a bit of a piece of string, but like a typical range of an engagement, you know, like what, what sort of the minimum spend someone would be looking at? We like to keep folks around for a while. We want to yeah. have an impact on what they do. It's like, do this project. I mean, yeah, we can, but we like to keep you around for a good six months to see the results. And if you like it, keep working together. So, you know, if we're talking kind of like uh, like retainer prices, we're looking at somewhere around, you know, three to $5,000 a month uh, with plenty of hours or points as we call them to work with you. Um, and it's everything from like, the discovery call, asking a bunch of questions, getting to know you and your business, to us thinking about it from like a RevOps standpoint and giving you ideas for strategy. And here are some tactics that you can go do on your own, or you can ask us to engage in certain ones. Like if you have to, you know, price pick some of them, we can do that at times. But yeah, I'd say it's somewhere around three to five thousand dollars a month is usually our good sweet spot. Yeah, more. Right. We'll take more. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> right. And we'll circle back to that point. Uh conversation because uh yeah i think everyone would love to to know a little bit more about that and and some of the problems that these smb businesses face you know what what do you see if you had to summarize three three of the key ones uh over 20 um you know the last 12 months what what would they be yeah you know one of the biggest ones we've seen in the last couple of years whether we talk about the beginning of the pandemic or financial things in the world or whatever it is but the last few years is revenue operations. People look at marketing and sales and service, the three main kind of buckets of business for a lot of us. That's the revenue side of it, right? And then how do we operationalize what we do for those? So that can include things like the tech stack for sure. Um, hey, I've got all this technology. I don't really know what's working or what's not. You know, My sales team uses this platform. My marketing uses that platform. Accounting uses this. And I got to export it all into a spreadsheet and I just, ah, right. Or my technology is so expensive. I don't know where to start cutting it. You know, we, we are in, again, depending on what economy you're in right now or what country you're in right now or whatever it is. Sometimes some people are in some, somewhat of a recession feeling. Some of us are in a growth feeling, but at the end of the day, we can't make money if we're not cutting corners somewhere. Right. As I say, cutting corners sounds terrible, but like cutting expenses, right. Um, so that operationalizing of our entire tech stack and our processes, that's one of the biggest ones. So RevOps. I think another, I think a part of that is things like how do I get more leads, right? How do I convince people to do business with me? The marketing side of it. How do I enable my sales team to do more with less sales enablement? How are we more consistent? So it's that marketing and sales alignment. So I'd say that those would probably be my two biggest ones is marketing and sales alignment and how does all that work together and then rev ops from that operational um, yeah, perspective. And, and their theme, so with this, you know, um, sort of dispersed tech stack because, you know, we've, uh, you as a, a partner uh, listening to Dan would have, you know, come across it all the time, right? Are, are you seeing any particular, you know, themes? Like is there, a, you know, particular tech stacks that people are moving off to go to HubSpot, which is, you know, more of a, a complete platform, uh, especially across those three key buckets that you spoke about. Are you seeing more of that? Or, you know, what are some of the things you're seeing with the tech stack space, if I can get that right? Yeah, fair question. I think some of this may be a little bit of a, of a bias also. I'll, I'll certainly throw that out there. We are a HubSpot solutions partner. So we have people coming to HubSpot from other systems. And this is not meant to disparage any system out there. You know, I know a lot of people who use certain systems and it's great. Platforms can be good or bad, depending on how your processes are. That's fine. But what I do see right now are two scenarios I think are the most popular. Number one is the disparate systems. Like somebody might come to us and say, hey, look, I've got um, pipe drive working with my MailChimp using Zapier uh, to bring it in from the spreadsheet and then update a Google sheet. And then uh, like, oh, okay. You know, Darmesh Shah, co-founder of HubSpot, called it a Franken system at one point. Yeah, Franken true. Style. Yep. Like, Correct. Yeah, Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankenstein's monster, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we see a lot of that, and and those ones that I mentioned are a lot of the popular ones. You know, um, people are are creating their website on WordPress, and they've got their landing pages in like a lead page type system, and then they've got and so it's just everything. The other one I see right now a lot of um, is Salesforce. Yeah. As great as Salesforce can be, I think what happened was there, you know, they, they came in and took out the big players back 
you know, in the like early 2000s, whatever it was, right? Maybe even 90s. I don't remember exactly when Salesforce was launched, but a while back, they became quickly the end all be all. Yes. And it was, it was great, but it was very complex. As I understand their business model, they bought and kind of cobbled together different pieces. So really when you have like, um, you know, uh, lightning version of Salesforce, then you've got part of, they're actually separate. And so you have to do certain things to make things work. So it's not truly one organic system. Um, and then it got, it got so big and complex that people didn't know how to use it. Right. You got to have a PhD. It's like, it's built by really smart PhD level engineers for their friends. Yes. And it's like HubSpot was built by ridiculously smart MIT level PhD engineers for people like me. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, I'm not that yeah, smart. So. Completely. Well, that, that, <laughs> right. Um, uh, we've got no evidence to prove that Dan so far. So uh, I can't, I can't well, go you. with that, but the, yeah. And I think, you know, we've seen, you know, a combination of both, right? So uh, often in, in the Cloud Consultants Collective, which is our community, we'll have, you know, HubSpot partners saying, hey, I'm working with someone with Salesforce, you know, that's so entrenched in some areas of their business, but we, therefore, they want us to come in and do these bits, right? So, and and that's probably a bit more at the enterprise level and it's at the the mid-market, but um, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And then the other one is around uh, more leads, right? Which I think is everyone's burning... Uh, platform at the moment and it seems like um, you know what what was easy so you know if you look at i don't know if it was facebook ads google search whatever it was like there was something that everyone gravitated to that brought in easy leads right it's like there is no easy leads out there at the moment and like you said you know we're recording this in 2023 the economy you know inflation's rampant you know everyone's putting the brakes on interest rates around the world and you know the economy's impacting and sadly it's not a political view but there is one individual in the world that's making it very hard for everyone else and i think we all know who that person is so firstly how do you see that when you say that you know more leads is an issue for some people and then you know i'd love to go into how you guys uh help to solve that yeah i mean more leads is what we all want right what you know i started in marketing 13 years ago before that i was in tv news when i got into marketing it was more leads i'm 13 years later it's more leads yeah and Paul, I like what you said. There are times when it's easy and there are times when it's not. Right now, it's not. But I think even during the easy times, sometimes it's, it is easy. A rising tide lifts all vessels. And so when the economy is good, we're like, hey, this is great. But there's still difficulties there, right? There's still difficulties reaching people at the right time with the right message. You know, at one point, several years ago, the number was like, the decision-making process is 70% finish before somebody even finds you. It's got to be later than that even now. It's probably 85% or 90% done. Yes. We do our research, right? So being able to get in front of them at that time is great, but it's not the only way. And that's the inbound way, right? That's very much the inbound philosophy. Get to them when they're ready. Okay. But what if they don't know they're ready? What if they don't know they're even necessarily looking? How do we get to them then? How do we generate leads, not just capture leads. That lead gen side of it is so important. So being top of mind with branding is also important. So there's a lot of things at play here. And and again, it just becomes difficult. We're more distracted than ever. We're more disconnected, even though we're more connected. Um, we can be really good at discerning between ads and marketing and just entertainment, but we also can be very bad at it. Yes, We can get taken sometimes. So that trust factor you know, I think it's like car salespeople and then marketers and then lawyers maybe below that. Like we are, we don't have a great trust factor. Oh, we've ruined everything. So, yeah. So we see that a lot though. How, how do I find more leads? That's the biggest question. You're absolutely right. Let's, you know, call out the elephant in the room, which is chat GPT, right? Because everyone's talking about it. It's like, you know, this, this thing, even though AI, AI solutions have been around for a while, you know, it's the one that's sort of, you know, getting all the attention at the moment. And from an inbound perspective, you know, all of a sudden people that can't really write content and haven't been doing it are going to start writing content, right? So to me, and you'll tell me because you're more in the trenches, but, you know, are we going to see a, a greater proliferation of, of content? Therefore, will that make it even more noisy and harder for whether it's, you know, the end client, but in particular us as, you know, running our own agencies and businesses is going to be harder with the advent of AI coming along. I'd love to get your perspective on that. So one thing that I, 
one positive I like about this generative AI writing side of it is that what you said is that people who can't write can now write. And that's absolutely true, whether they can't write or don't have time to write. So I think a lot of consultants are probably small businesses, right? A one person shop. This is my business. I'm the consultant. I do everything. Bro, you ain't got time to write. Sounds super casual there. That's the thing. You don't have time to write. Or maybe you're not great at writing. You can talk to people. You can see their their problem and give them the answers and walk them through. You can be a great coach, consultant, all these things. But writing may not be your strong suit. Great. You know what? This is going to help you. And I'm okay with that personally. As a writer myself, great. Go for it. I still feel that I have a powerful voice as a writer. But maybe I've gotten lazy over the last five years. This is going to make me better. Right? It might make me faster, too. If I'm thinking about writing a draft, I might go into a generative AI writing like chat GPT and say, give me a prompt on, you know, how to set up my CRM uh, with, you know, the customer centric point of view in the voice of Simon Sinek. And it gives me this couple of bullet points, a couple of prompts, a couple of paragraphs. Now I can go build on that and make it my own in some way. Right. I better not plagiarize. Yes. But I can do something more. So I think that's the good side of it. Yeah. Now, the downside of it, the dark side of it is that content proliferation. It is, it is, and there's other things too. There's other dark sides to AI. I've been listening, sidebar, I've been listening to a, a podcast lately about the ethics of marketing. And it's really interesting to talk about this whole AI thing. Not my rabbit trail to chase because I'm not yeah. quite yes. that smart, but yes. it's amazing. But there are some dark sides. But one of the dark sides is that content overload. You're absolutely right. And Mark Schaefer wrote about it in one of his books quite quite several years ago that even before all this AI stuff and the generative writing of it all, there was already this, we're getting so much content in the world. Yes. But here's my proposal to you. While that is annoying and sometimes dangerous and maybe a little bit noisy, here's the thing. How many books exist in the world today compared to how many did 50 years ago? How many TV shows? How many movies? They're out there. They're still finding audiences. It may not be the biggest audience, but they're still finding audiences. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, for crying out loud, is ridiculously large. There are still movies being made about other superheroes, but other, other stories, about other love stories. I don't think, like, I don't know. There's so much information being created. That's absolutely true. It does get noisy. But I still think that knowing who your buyer persona is, who your ideal client profile is, and going after them with the exact value and then being creative and having some fun with it, I think it's it's, it's just going to make us better. Yeah, look, I totally agree. And if you look at, you know, I used to be uh, consultants and coaches, right? So, you know, basically all things to all people. And, you know, in the last 12 months, I've said, no, it'll be just cloud consultants. That's all. Now, I think there's roughly 60,000 of you. Uh, in the world and you know they that information you know is an okay source but you know it's probably a lot more right so to me i can just create content specifically for this audience that's why i brought an expert like you on who's living it to share it with others right so yeah i, I completely get it if if you you know where it used to be go to google and search and it was quite generic now you know you can get very specific content. So I think that's a plus. But if we look at your business, right? And you know, if you practice what you preach, which is inbound, what what are you guys doing from an inbound perspective? And you know, what's working, what's not working for you at the moment to attract more leads into your agency? So I think that the, the first of all, it's always testing. When you ask what's yeah. working and what's not, I have so many thoughts to like, well, this isn't working right now, but it might later, but blah, blah, blah. Yes. But at the end of the day, the the important thing is to be testing. We know a conversion path at its core, the definition has been how do we get someone to be, go from a viewer and convert them into a contact and then into a customer. That's the generic part of it, right? Yes. And that often has looked like a CTA button, a call to action button in the wild, maybe at the end of a blog post or somewhere else, or a banner ad for advertising, right? That goes to a landing page where they land, fill out a form because they want your offer. Now you get to have their information and email market to them, right? Use email marketing to reach them. That's a pretty basic. That doesn't work as well as it used to. Now we have things like chat bots that people come to the site and says, hey, you're on this page. People who are on this page ask about this more often. Can I help you with that? And they're like, oh yeah, cool. 
well, give me your name so I can call you by name. Oh, sure. My name's Dan. Great, Dan. Hey, if we get disconnected, can you give me your email address? Oh, sure. It's, you know, dan at impulsecreative.com. Great, Dan. So listen, what are you looking for? And this, this chat bot or even a live chat person can be doing this. And it's less about the conversion path and more about a conversation. So that conversational marketing has become very powerful. So while traditional conversion paths don't work as well as they used to, we're rethinking them and doing something different. One of my favorite things right now, though, Paul, is is actually, and I haven't talked about this on any other shows or talked about it much in, in the wild per se, but I, I read a part of a book recently, Mark Schaefer, I mentioned earlier, he has a new book out about community being the next frontier in marketing. Um, I put together some other resources, if you like I'm doing for HubSpot, a, a thing called a boot camp about how to create a sustainable community for your marketing sales and service of a business. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about community lately. Yes. I'm a member of several communities, officially, personally, professionally, all that stuff. So I'm thinking community right now. So what you just described earlier, Paul, is all those cloud consultants, there's 60,000 of you all out there roughly. That's a community. How can you build them a community? Or for those other consultants that are out there thinking, okay, I want to do this for my niche. Yes. How can you build that community? And, and can you own that community? Yes. Right. You mentioned Facebook earlier being a place we used to go. We don't go much, much anymore because they've the algorithm has made us irrelevant as yes. marketers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, we don't. So, so you, sorry, just yeah. add it to cut yeah. in there, but, but are you, so are you guys thinking of creating your own community, like for your agency, or you're looking to do this for clients or both? Both for sure. So we've, we've tried it. We tested a community idea called Sprocket Talk, yeah. all about the HubSpot Sprocket. Their logo looks like a sprocket. So it's going to be the Sprocket Talk. And we had a ton of content, but we didn't really understand community at the time, the way we thought we did. Yeah. very transparently. So it didn't work as well as we thought. We had tons of viewers, lots of subscribers. It was great. But there wasn't a real sense of community, people asking each other questions and helping each other and making it about them. It was really more about us and our content. So now we've taken to thinking about it in a different way. Do we create that community? Do we join other communities and just help people? So it may not necessarily be in creating your own community, but joining a community. But if you can create your own, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that much like I used to say about inbound back in the early days, anyone can do inbound marketing and it'll work for them. An asterisk, like you have to do it well, you have to understand certain things, all that's true. I feel the same way about community right now. I feel like if you can start even a micro community and begin to, to own the data of that community, so you understand things like what are they talking about in their posts? Um, where do they live? How are they interacting with other things? Like all these different things. Yes. yes. If you own that data, then you can begin to build your communications with them and your relationship with them based on a lot of factors, right? Um, if you build it in like, like you can have a Slack community. Slack is great. We use Slack at work a lot, but it's not a community because guess what? I can't export keywords of what somebody has talked about. I can't see what topics they're interested in. I can't see the behavior of what they're doing. They say they want to know this, but they always go here instead or whatever. So building your community with your data at the core, I think is important. So I think community truly is the next thing that's that's beginning to build. Yeah, and hopefully think, marketers don't ruin it. And I'm a marketer, so I don't want to do that. Yeah, look, I think it's brilliant. And, and like, like I said, we, you know, we're, we experimented last year with, with ours. We, we call it a collective because... You know, the hard thing is there's a lot of communities out there, like you said. So, you know, on Slack in particular, ours is on Slack. So you might, you know, you know one of 50. So how do you stand out in that 50, et cetera? But, you know, I, I do love the fact that it, it, you know, it builds research. Like you said, you know, you, you're hearing, you know, it's the classic marketing. You're hearing all the things that you're meant to do from a research perspective. You're getting it on this community. And also that data point where I don't know the exact, exact stats but where people will trust a peer over an expert you know more times yes. right so it's the similar thing like it's you know it's peers referring to to each other and you're just help helping uh, cultivate that so i think that's that's really good so for you guys if you looked at you know our total lead capture for you know this year let's say 2023 how much of it will come from community and how much will it come from other sources 
I would predict that leads coming from community this year are probably going to be a small portion of what we do. I think the biggest two factors for us still today are content marketing and referrals. Yeah. Right. Our content, whether it's YouTube videos or podcasts or articles or resources or whatever, or the partnerships that we have with HubSpot. Like I said, I'm, I'm working with HubSpot Academy right now on a boot camp, and it's, and it's amazing. And we're going to get leads from it just because we're doing good work. So that's a big part of his content marketing. The other one is referrals, right? Whether it's HubSpot referrals directly or someone goes into the HubSpot um, solutions partner uh, marketplace and sees our listing in there with all of our reviews. So there's those two things, which, by the way, I just mentioned their reviews, like adding force to your flywheel with things like word of mouth marketing, reviews, that kind of stuff. That's just another part of all the things that you're doing. So that I think will be the vast majority of our leads still. Community, we're still building. I'll be honest, we're still learning. Yeah. yeah you know, right, how do we right. build this into a true community? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's all around that diversification as well, right? But um, yeah, I think that's that's really smart. And and always go back to, you know, the more niche or niche you are, the easier it is to build communities and then you go from there. So that's just the you know, the way that I recommend to the, the cloud consultants and the agencies that I work with, you know, that that all yeah. um, works nice and tightly. So you, you talked about HubSpot and your relationship with HubSpot. So, you know, what are some things that you guys do to, uh, so I suppose, get an unfair advantage for HubSpot versus maybe some of your, um, your peers? Like the HubSpot referrals, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what are you guys doing? You know, tell us your, your secrets on how you we- get more. We work really hard and we're very creative. So there are, so our co-founder Remington, our CEO, I I tell the story this way. Someone could come to us and say, so-and-so told me I can't do this with HubSpot. And Remington will say, hold my beer. Remington actually drinks Captain and Coke, but anyway. um, (laughs) But like he has made such amazing things happen with this platform that even HubSpot said, I don't think we can do that. So, a very, very creative mind who has set the culture of creativity yes. has hired some really smart developers and people to be able to do things. And then on top of that, you know, out of the 50 of us that, that exist in this company, we have developers and marketers and strategists and specialists and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a trainer and myself and, and my colleague, Josh. But I think that our unfair advantage is that agility and creativity coupled with just a persistence to get stuff done. Um, there's a lot of great partners in the, in the ecosystem, no doubt, who have a lot of those tenants. But I think ours is just this magic, like this magical, I don't even know what the word is, this magical formula of of just goodness. And so we've made a name for ourselves um, for that. Now, I will say, I think what HubSpot's doing right now is really cool that they don't want it to be this super exclusive, like, oh, we only have these three partners we give all of our leads to. They're trying to truly give to their community to all of their partners and say, okay, look, at this level of tier, you're going to get certain benefits. And so we're at the top level, so we get those. And other than that, it's really about giving good service and not just being top of mind. But let's yeah. be honest, it's always about relationships. Top of mind's important. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, that's where like, you know, community is a good boat for you guys to add because to me, there's, you know, roughly seven levers. Well, I have my seven levers that I, um, look at for driving revenue within, you know, our businesses. And, you know, I think, you know, leaving all your eggs in the SaaS referral basket uh, is is high risk. I remember for us, we were getting 80 leads a month and then uh, a new VC came into the table, the board, and all of a sudden they said, we're going to turn off uh, what was uh, paid acquisition and go all to inbound content. But I'm like, hang on, but, Surely there's a transition here, but no, it was just overnight they turned it off, right? So it forced us to do LinkedIn and other things to protect the fact that we had all our eggs in in one basket. And it was our fault, right? The, the fact that they made the decision was outside of our influence, but the fact that we hadn't made sure that we had multiple sources of revenue and you know ultimately leads leading into revenue was the, the greatest risk. So I think it's really smart for you guys to to do that. And is there anything from a referral perspective that you you know you guys are doing that you know, we should know about right, that's once again that's that's different or um unique? 
So I don't, I don't know if it's unique necessarily, but I've found a lot of success in the last six months in simply asking for reviews. Now, HubSpot, I mentioned the solutions partner directory or marketplace. You can you can segment the partners in there by the tier, by the price point, by all kinds of things. But reviews drive you to the top, whatever segment you're in. The more reviews, the better. Yeah. And so we have taken to um, really being strategic about when someone gives us, I'll say me, I'll use me as the example. When someone gives me that idea that they had a really good time with their training program, say, great, thank you so much. I appreciate that. By the way, if this was truly a five-star experience for you, will you consider going here and giving us a quick review? And I do that through an email and I ask that specific question. My my boss, Julie, taught me this. If this was a five-star review, please go ahead and tell us all about it on this link. And if not, please reply or email my boss to tell them why it wasn't and we'll fix it. So that right there is, I think, huge for referrals because the more, the you know, the better the reviews, the more the reviews, again, people trust other people more than your own promotions. So I think that's a huge one for referrals. Yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes it's, you know, people say, you know, um, common sense is, isn't always that common, but it's it's those big flywheels at which, you know, it, it's set up there, it's in front of you, but sometimes you're doing so many tactics, right, to sort of, you know, make the numbers up. But it's like, you know, that is, you know, it's one of the biggest flywheels for HubSpot to refer agencies. So why not? Make sure that 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 is uh, that flywheel's oiled well. So, well done for that. So, you know we're near at the end, but we talked about the point system, right? So you said you know try you know um, people are on retainers, but they've got a point system. Now I've known lots of HubSpot agencies that have tried this. Some have worked really well, some haven't. But tell us a little bit about how the point systems, you know, that you've implemented, how that works. Paul, well, I like to think that I'm a simple guy. Yeah, I don't like to complicate things. As I understand our point system, it's basically just ours. We call them points, but not every point equals a total hour, I yeah. guess. And here's what I mean. I do training sessions that are, let's say, 50 minutes long. Yes. So you're technically not getting a full hour with me. You're getting a point. That other 10 minutes is usually for things like admin paperwork, maybe an email that we send back and forth, whatever. So it's almost like I say I'm a psychologist without having the credentials. <laughs> I bill you an hour, but you only get 50 minutes. But what it is, it's it, those points are effectively hours, and so we charge, you know, X amount per hour, um, and I and I believe our rate right now, just to be transparent, is two hundred dollars a point. Yeah. And so, if we think it's going to take ten hours to build your your workflow with the lead nurturing and everything else, and then it's going to be two thousand dollars. Now we try to build in some other value into that, right? We're going to say it's going to take you know, 10 hours, maybe we can deliver it sooner and give you some extra value at somewhere else or whatever. Um, but that's the idea is that the points are, look, we're going to have a discovery call with you, ask you all these questions. We're going to put together some work on the back end. So it's going to cost some points there. And then we're going to pitch you the idea that if you spend, you know, two points a week with us for this kind of a strategy versus six points for that kind of a strategy, here's going to be your results most likely. And you get to choose which one you want. Um, so, yeah, so I, I laughed earlier because what's the secret? I think points are just hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, That's cool. And, and look, and and I think that makes more sense because I've seen some people that have tried to, you know, it becomes very, very complicated very quickly. There's bonus points for this and all of a sudden, you know, this is worth this amount of points. And like all of a sudden, you know, what they were trying to do is make something more client friendly actually turns into a, a nightmare for the client and then they just end up going back to where they started. So I think, you know, if you are listening to Dan, you're thinking about doing it and, you know, hit Dan up to, to ask him more about it. I think the simpler you keep it, uh, the better. And uh, just out of interest, how long you've been using the point system at Impulse Creative? Uh, longer than I've been here. Yeah, so okay. uh, how long you've been? I, I believe, so I've been here four years now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been definitely, I'd say at least it, the minimum six years we've been doing it, yeah. but probably even before that. I think it was one of those early decisions that Remington and Rachel made as co-founders that this was going to be how they were going to structure it based on how HubSpot kind of taught the model. Yeah, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. All right, well, look, um, it's been great covering the sections. You know, we've talked about 
the the reviews which are really important we've talked about the the point system you've also talked about the role that content you know is is playing and we've also talked about some other great things but now it's time to do a rapid fire where i'm going to ask you some questions and get some rapid fire responses and it looks like you're absolutely ready so let's ready. uh let's yeah. go so the first one is what are some daily habits you do to help you scale your business or your part of the business you got to structure your time I set my calendar up every week to have my time structured and I follow it. I'll move things around if I need to, but structuring that time is so important. And I start my day with the easiest wins. I like to have an admin half hour. I like to have a little bit of social media time, a little bit of community time, and then I get into my meetings. I love that. Brilliant. And um, and what about for you? Where do you find out more about your area of expertise, which is training? Where, you know, where, where are you finding that at? Um, my favorite place to learn new stuff is Masterclass plug for masterclass. Uh, and then also, um, podcasts. I go for daily walks every day and I listen to a podcast 90% of the time. And so just finding those voices that don't always match mine. Right. And, um, you know, this is normally for Remington and Rachel, as far as the owners. Now what's one grant we can give you, but what about for you and your role? What's one wish that we could grant you? So while I may not own the business, I am fully emotionally invested in this business. I love what we do and, and who I do it for. So my wish would be to be able to scale at a strategic and controlled rate that we don't get too big too fast. Um, I've seen too many businesses hire too fast and have to lay people off, right? Especially in the last couple of years here. Um, so I, if that was my magic wand, I'd say help us to scale strategically and, and quickly enough that we don't get too big for our britches. Yeah. Okay. Great. And the last question is, what do you know now? And if you look from, you know, working within a HubSpot agency, what do you know now that you wish you had have known earlier? I wish I would have known early on how project management is such a huge part of what running an agency is. Yeah. I'm into that. I don't like project management. No, no. And uh, I need it. Right. Yeah. Correct. Correct. It's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's and it's always that rub. You talked before around, you know, the different um, areas of marketing, sales, and then your service, like project management, you know, is the glue that sticks that together, but it's always, you know, getting the rough bits. And and I remember very quickly at Coca-Cola, you know, the new product team was the team that wanted project management the most because they had to go across every function, right? And they had the hardest business job in the business because they had to try to bring it all together. So uh, fortunately these days, we've got a lot of great tools. Uh, back in those days, there was, you know, Excel or there was uh, my, uh, Microsoft Project or whatever it was, which uh, no offense to any of you that are micro Microsoft partners listening here, but that's the worst product I've ever touched. Anyway, we digress. So it is the rapid fire. So we're going to end there, but uh, we've been talking to Dan Moyle from impulsecreative.com and we're going to have all the links to the show notes, et cetera, that I'll talk about uh, in the outro. But, uh, yeah, Dan, uh, wonderful for you sharing your time on Pre President's Day in the U.S. Uh, with us. And, uh, yeah, it was great to have you on. It's always been a pleasure. That was a great interview with Dan. And please hit him up for those reviews, those uh, scripts. I think it was a great idea. And also share what you liked on LinkedIn. And uh, he will love that. Mention uh, Dan, the link will be in the show notes. And if you have one, maybe five, 10, how many peers that could benefit from this, please share it with them. Uh, there's nothing worse than keeping great content from your friends. Check out our solo shows. If you're scaling your cloud consulting business and want to know the blueprint to success, go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash blueprint. Uh, get your free copy today. And finally, take action to scale quickly with less effort to enjoy life more. Learning is just one piece of the puzzle. It is now time for action. Head to today's show page at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. Get the links and put it into action. Head to your favorite podcast platform, subscribe, rate, and review the show. Suggest topics for me to cover at paul at paulhigginsmentoring.com. And don't wait one more minute to gain access to content, especially for you, a cloud consultant, at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash newsletter. This could be the difference between wasting time figuring it out yourself or scaling quickly with less effort to enjoy life.